Did you see the uh, lawsuit? Uh, I think this is a petition to the Supreme Court. I might be using the wrong legal words here. But Ted Cruz has apparently put together a, uh, an appeal in which he's challenging the Pennsylvania, part of the Pennsylvania result. And here's the thing. If you are waiting for a strong case, <laughs> where, where you're thinking to yourself, gosh, I, I hope someday there's a stronger case for the Trump side. Well, uh, if you don't know this already, Ted Cruz has argued and won cases at the Supreme Court. So Ted Cruz is the guy you don't want to mess with if you're going to be in a legal uh, battle. You know, you imagine yourself, you get in a legal battle and you're thinking to yourself, God, I, I hope the other side doesn't bring somebody good. And then Ted Cruz shows up as the attorney for the other side and you just say to yourself, damn it, damn it, it's Ted Cruz. So here's the argument he's going to make. I'm going to butcher this. And I'm... Um, I'm uh, I'm drafting off of uh, <laughs> Jack Posobiec, who yesterday did a live stream on this. So I, I'm basically going to tell you what Jack Posobiec said on his live stream, because I don't understand this field. But he did a good job of breaking it down, and it goes like this. So there was... Uh, I don't know if I can get into the details, but the, the essence of it was that prior to the election, there was no standing meaning that nobody had been injured by anything until the election happened. And, the, and the, the charge was that some changing in the rules that didn't go through the constitutional system created an unconstitutional thing, which uh, happened. And the claim is that those votes that were part of this unconstitutional decision uh, should be thrown out. And the argument is really, really clever in a legal way, which is why I'm going to butcher it probably. But the, the thing is that until the election happens, no, but nobody has been harmed. And apparently you can't bring an action to the court and say, hey, there's this thing that happened when it hasn't happened. You're simply worried that a thing will happen. So in the beginning, you have no standing, so you don't have a legal remedy. Then the election happens. And then... The court says, too late, because you knew about this thing a long time ago, but you waited until now, and there's this thing called the Doctrine of Latches that I heard about one day ago, and that says you waited too long to bring your case, and that is a disadvantage to whoever you're bringing your case against. So you can either be too early and have no standing, or you could be too late because it's too late. And there's no, there's, no, there's no room in between. <laughs> now, Ted Cruz has said, you've done something that is clearly and unambiguously unconstitutional. And indeed, I don't even think Pennsylvania would argue the point. I don't even know if there's an argument that says it was constitutional, because they very publicly did something non-constitutional right in front of everybody. The, the, I don't think there's any question of fact that it was a non-constitutional means. The problem is that in addition to doing something non-constitutional, on top of that, like that wasn't already enough reason to reverse it, on top of that, the courts created a situation where it couldn't be addressed in the courts because there was no time between the you don't have any standing and it's too late. There was no time. <laughs> so let me ask you this. If you're the Democrats... And you hear that the you know the angel of death, uh, Ted Cruz, has has decided to put his name. Keep in mind, Ted Cruz has a you know a track record, a reputation of success with the Supreme Court. He's putting his name on this damn thing, right? Do you think he'd put his name on it if it were not pretty solid? I don't think so. Now I'm no expert on law. And, you know, when you hear about stuff like the doctrine of latches and you say to yourself, oh, I thought I kind of understood things and, until I heard that and I don't know what the hell that's all about. So I don't like to think that I know too much about what will happen in a court case. But as a layperson, if you tell me 
this story, you know, the way that Ted Cruz has laid it out, you tell me that Ted Cruz put his name on it, he put his name on it, I'd be a little bit worried about that if I were a Democrat. So, what do you think are the odds that at least Pennsylvania will be reversed? If you had to bet, now some of you haven't seen the, the, uh, the legal documents, the claims, but if you had to bet, what are the odds that just that one state, we'll just talk about that in isolation, what are the odds that that would be reversed based on this? Pretty good, <laughs> right? Pretty good. I think it's closer to 100% than zero, but beyond that, you know, I, I would just be flailing. So I'll, I'll have to see uh, what the counter arguments are. It's always easy to be seduced by the initial argument because lawyers are good at making the initial argument, no matter what it is, sound pretty good. You have to wait for the other side or you don't know anything. All right. Let's talk about how the Democrats may have allegedly, allegedly not proven in any court of law, pulled off the perfect alleged crime. And it goes like this. And i got to tell you, if it sounds like I'm a little bit excited by this, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I, I absolutely love seeing a new business model. I'm sort of a business model geek, but I would include a perfect crime. If somebody pulls up, pulls off a perfect crime, I don't like it, especially if I'm a victim of the crime, but I'm still impressed by a really good crime. All right. So similar to the way that I could be uh, totally amused and entertained by President Trump's you know, aggressive personality toward his critics, um, I can simply appreciate things without, without losing sight of the fact that there's a downside to a lot of things. All right? So here's, here's the perfect crime as I see it. Alleged. Did you hear me say alleged? All right. So uh, these circles represent the alleged instances of fraud in all the many places in the many different uh, precincts and counting areas. Now, let's just limit these to the swing state cities, the ones that are under question. And let's say, hypothetically, so this is not a claim of fact, this is a hypothetical, but it's looking like it's shaping up this way. Hypothetically, suppose that these black circles represented real fraud, but they are all cleverly sized such that if somebody discovered one of these, what would the court say? The court would say, yeah, it does look like that happened, but it's so small compared to the whole election, it's not going to reverse it. So there's no point in even hearing it, because even if it's true, what's the difference? Now, there might be a separate criminal case if there's a person who did something bad, but in terms of reversing the election the court is going to say, yeah, you, you've got a pretty strong case, but we don't care because it's not big enough to reverse the election, which is the whole point. So they packetized their crime so that if you found that somebody brought in, I'll just use some uh, hypothetical examples. So these are not Scott claiming facts. I mean, it's just an example. So, so suppose one of these was somebody brought in a truck full of fake ballots, and there were 20,000 of them. And they catch that truck, and they say, we're throwing out those 20,000 ballots. Doesn't matter. Wasn't enough. Wasn't enough. Then somebody else was putting in a, you know, a USB stick into something and changing some votes, and somebody else was running the same votes through, and somebody else was changing the sensitivity on the signatures. Somebody else was doing a little uh, ballot harvesting in a state where you're not supposed to do some ballot harvesting. And on and on and on and on. Now, the second part is these red circles represent disinformation, intentional disinformation. And on top of the intentional disinformation, which you know exists, you, you can be pretty sure that the Democrats did hire disinformation professionals, actual people who don't do anything else. 
well, they do other things, but they're experts at disinformation. I would say there's pretty much a guarantee that they were at work. And they seeded this with a bunch of fake stuff so that if the news found one of these fakes, and then two of these fakes, and then three of these fakes, and then four of these fakes, and then 25 of them, what is the public going to think? Because the fake news says, well, yeah, they're making a lot of claims. Fake claim, fake claim, fake, fake claim. You lost in court, you lost in court, you lost in court, you lost in court, you lost in court. What does the public think? What would the public think, who is not following things at the detail that many of you are, what would they think? Well, they would be quite... Um, you could forgive them for thinking that this was a completely clean election and even the people in charge of the election told you it was clean. So the experts told you it was a good election. The news told you every time they made a claim, it got debunked, 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 debunked. What the hell are you going to think? You're going to think the election was clean, the loser's a sore loser who's complaining. All right? But on top of this, you've got this excellent timing situation that I alluded to, that before the, before the alleged improprieties happen, it's too soon to, make a, to have a problem with it because there's, there's no standing in court because nobody's injured yet. And then after it's done, the timer starts because the Constitution requires you to certify and move to each step and to be done with it in a, in a specific time. How much time did, let's say, Durham take for his investigation? Well, he's not done yet. How much time did Mueller need for the Mueller report? A long time. <laughs> so we know that how, how long it takes to do a complicated investigation, especially with all this disinformation here. Imagine if, imagine if Mueller and John Durham had to spend 75% of all of their time chasing disinformation. I'll bet they didn't, because I don't know that anybody was... I don't know if there was any reason to do it, to inject disinformation into the Mueller report. I mean, the, uh, obviously, the, uh, the things he was investigating were disinformation, but I don't think on top of that people were injecting disinformation to make it harder. So... Anybody who would want to find uh, real fraud and prove it and, and get the level of evidence you would need would have the most compressed time frame to do it, and on top of a compressed time frame, would have the entire media against them, and would have, um, uh, and would have so they would have the timing problem, and then they would have all the the disinformation that they have to wade through, which would take them even longer. So. It's the perfect crime. It's the perfect crime. Because I think that after this is all said and done, the history will record, okay, it took us a long time. It might take you five years. And five years later, you get a, a whistleblower who says, yeah, you know, I drove that truck. And then maybe it's six years later and somebody comes out and says, I got to admit... I did mess with those machines a little bit. Got to admit, I'm on my deathbed. I'm just going to tell you. So you can imagine the history will piece it together eventually. 